Well, the left has been literally outraged. They've gone, frankly, quite ballistic ever since the court decision on Friday uh, that the FDA bypassed safety concerns in the political rush to put chemical abortion drugs on the market. And missing from all the left's talking points in this is consideration of the merits of the decision that was made last Friday, let alone any analysis as to how best to protect the health of women. Uh, quite frankly, the abortion industry claims that it exists to support the health of the mother, but the abortion pill regimen absolutely poses significant health risks, uh, dangers to those who take it. So the left is all too eager to ignore the truth here, to ignore the science. Joining me now to discuss this is Dr. Ingrid Scott. She's the vice president and director of medical affairs at the Charlotte Lozier Institute. Uh, Dr. Scott, thank, thank you so much for being back on Washington Watch. It's an honor to have you. Thank you. I'm so happy to be back with you guys. Well, let's get started here. I want to play uh, to begin with some remarks that were made Sunday by HHS Secretary Javier Becerra. Of course, he's the, the top Biden health care official, but his, his remarks regarding Friday's court ruling. If the role of judges of justices is to apply the law to the facts and the evidence, the facts and the scientific evidence are that Mifepristone is not just safe, but it's effective and it was properly approved. There's so much about that com those comments are just absolutely inaccurate. We know that the FDA rushed these pills to approval for political reasons 20 years ago. So let's let's begin. Just walk our uh, walk our viewers and listeners through what the FDA ignored and and talk about the dangers of these pills. Absolutely. The the pills themselves are two two medications. Mifepristone blocks progesterone receptors. It cuts off the hormonal support that causes the embryo to die. And then it's followed generally about 24 hours later by mesoprostol that induces labor to expel the pregnancy tissue. Mifepristone was approved um, by the FDA in 2000, and we see that the entire process was politicized. President Clinton asked the French manufacturer to bring it here. He intervened in the process. The FDA approved the drug under a special category, subpart H, accelerated approval regulations, which is meant for drugs that treat life-threatening illnesses for which there is no other treatment available. Well, pregnancy, of course, is almost never a life-threatening illness. And surgical abortions were widely available. In the 1990s, there were between a million and a million and a half surgical abortions every year. So that was already available to women. These chemical abortion pills we find over and over have at least four times the complications. At the time that they approved it, the studies that they used were very poor quality. In the United States, we don't have much about abortion data that is mandatorily requested. So if the abortion industry decided to tell the FDA about their complications, then they knew about it. And if not, then that information remained unknown. The FDA did not um, study young women. Um, they're required to by their own laws, um, women under the age of 18, but there is no lower age limit. 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds take these pills, and it has never been studied how they affect them. Um, going on, the FDA has used... Um, has loosened restrictions over and over. And the reality right now is that there is no requirement that a doctor look a woman in the eye, that he do an ultrasound to determine gestational age or rule out ectopic pregnancy, um, that he even um, uh, confirm that it's a woman seeking abortion. Uh, people are getting these pills over the internet. So we know that there's a lot of malfeasance and people getting the pills who don't need to have access to them. All right, you bring up a lot of incredibly important points right there. Uh, and you know, the, the bottom line, I suppose, is that the, the, the facts and the scientific evidence is not what was considered 20 years ago. In fact, if I can paraphrase more or less my understanding of what the Clinton administration communicated to the FDA was this bill is going to uh, be approved uh, and, and it's going to be pushed through. So let's kind of back up and discuss more specifically and remind our audience here of the, the dangers of these chemical abortion pills. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we keep hearing the mantra safe and effective, safe and effective. But what does that mean? It doesn't mean that there aren't complications. Um, the abortion industry generally will publish studies saying about one to two percent of the time it fails requiring surgery. But again, they're only telling us about the complications they know about. They tell women it's safer than Tylenol. So when these women do have complications, they feel betrayed. They feel misled. Um, and so they don't go back to that abortion provider. They go to other gynecologists. They go to emergency rooms. I've taken care of many of these women in Texas, and they're surprised and they're afraid. They're um, they're ha they're hemorrhaging or sometimes they're bleeding for long periods of time, six, eight weeks, because the tissue, um, the dead tissue can't be expressed. And this, of course, leads them at risk for infection. When we look at good quality studies, um, records linkage where we know the abortions and we can find all of the medical events afterwards, um, we find that about five to eight percent, more than one in 20 of these women has a failed abortion. So she has to have another surgical procedure. And again, these procedures are often in um, emergent situations, in emergency rooms where doctors have to drop the care of their other patients to go take care of the woman who's in distress. Um, so clearly these are, it, it's a horrible experience for women. It's a terrible way to care for women um, and uh, four times more complicated than surgical abortions. So why did they switch from surgical to chemical? Well, they did it so they, they could um, provide more abortions so they could bypass state regulations. And the truth is that most obstetricians don't want to perform a surgical abortion. So they were having trouble finding doctors even willing to provide abortion, which is why they chose to prioritize chemical abortions. Dr. Scott, if you would, I'm going to ask if you would to join us to hang over and come back for our next se segment after the break. I want to play this, uh, and, and you bring up some point. I mean, unbelievable that we're actually giving a drug that's dangerous, and one out of 50 are going, who take it are going to have to have surgeries. But uh, real quickly, I want to play a clip, and after the break, I want to get your reaction to it. Mifepristone has been a safe and effective FDA-approved medication for over 20 years. For over 20 years. Think about that. It's the gold standard in medication abortion care. Uh, saying that this is the gold standard of uh, abortion health care. Give me your response to that. Well, first of all, it, it's incredible to hear someone describe a method for killing human beings as the gold standard. I, I felt a little like I might be back in Nazi Germany, but it is the only chemical abortion regimen that is approved by the FDA. So I suppose she's trying to make the point that it's an approved regimen. But as this lawsuit points out, if the FDA broke its own rules, if it used suboptimal data to approve this medication, I mean, the the, per, the sole purpose of the FDA is to protect the American people from dangerous drugs. And these drugs are clearly dangerous for women, five to eight percent requiring surgery, often in emergent situations. So a surgical abortion, again, is much safer for a woman. So if the industry really cared about women, they'd be offering them surgical abortions. But what they do is they promote these chemical abortions. They tell them it's natural. They can have the abortion in the comfort of their own home. They make it sound like it's this great thing. But what happens, these women are now living in their abortion clinic. Every time they walk into their restroom, they remember the pain, the bleeding, and in many cases, the sight of their own child's body. Because at 10 weeks gestational age, this baby is about the size of a gummy bear. He's clearly identifiable as a human being. So this is a horrible way to treat women. But, you know, they've already told us what their next step is. It's not to promote more surgical abortions. It's to take the second component of this pill, which is even more dangerous. Mesoprostol alone fails in 22% of women. So almost one out of four women will require surgery. But they're already telling us we're going to go ahead and direct women toward the one uh, pill regimen, which is mesoprostol alone, because it's easier to obtain. And this is clearly showing us that their priority is not women's safety. It's the ending the life of unborn humans. Well, it's the ending the life of unborn children, but it's a pushing uh, really their sacred cow of a political agenda. And specifically in this instance, the abortion industry 
Uh, going back to the uh, health implications of these drugs, the uh, reporting is rarely detailed of the, the issues that you're bringing forth right now, but uh, there was a recent uh, New York Times piece that attempted, frankly, to defend these pills, but at the same time, they literally illustrated their danger with some of the stats that you mentioned, well, how many women taking these pills end up with uh, having to have surgery or some other uh, emergency room visit or whatever it may uh, be. Well, what did you think of the article? Well, the article had some really amazing graphics. So if you're somebody who's just impressed by icons moving around, it looked very impressive. But when we dug into it, for one thing, they didn't even link to all the studies that they said they were reporting on. So there's no way to know to really look at the studies. But um, the problem with so many of these studies is a large amount of women lost to follow up. Again, we just can't link the records because most abortions in our country are paid for privately. So those women lost to follow up, the studies usually assume that was an uncomplicated abortion. But as the doctor who's cared for so many of these women, I can tell you it's more likely those were complicated abortions. Um, they uh, the, the studies that Charlotte Lozier produced, which are very high quality records linkage studies, they acted like these weren't important studies, but in fact, these were able to detect that in many cases, the women who presented to emergency rooms and, um, and had complications were miscoded as having been due to a miscarriage. So it just goes to show how poor our data is in the United States. But Having five to 8% complications qualifies as a common complication. That is not safe and effective. And the euphemisms that the abortion industry uses to push these products really aren't going to work anymore. We've got to look behind the curtain. We've got to see what the data really shows. And we've got to recognize in 2020, there were over half a million chemical abortions. If 5% of those women had complications, that means 25,000 women had complications. That is not safe. That's not safe. Listen, we've only got about a minute left, so I hate that our conversation is coming to a, a rapid conclusion. But one of the other issues they were rarely talked about is how these drugs are used in the uh, w for women trapped in sex trafficking. I mean, this is uh, an additional problem that uh, needs attention. In about 30 seconds, your response. Yeah, absolutely. It is acknowledged that one of the best places where you can intercept a trafficked woman is in a medical healthcare setting, but they've taken these pills totally outside of medical supervision. So their women are getting them, they're taking them, they're suffering complications. And unless the complication is severe where they end up in an emergency room, they're never seeing a doctor at all. So we've missed an opportunity to try to intervene for these poor, unfortunate women. We really have. And this is a time, I think, for all of us to look in the mirror and to recognize the enormous task we have before us to educate people as to the reality of these uh, chemical abortion drugs. Thank you so much, Dr. Ingrid Skop. Thank you for uh, hanging over for a, a double segment here on this incredibly important topic. My pleasure, Congressman, thank you.